This short depth server can handle GPUs and a Ryzen processor. But not only that, it can also fit a brand new AMD Epic 4000 series processor. And of course, because this is an ASRock rack server, there always has to be something that's fun in it. And in this video, we're gonna take the little wimpy heatsink that comes in the base model, and instead, we're gonna use this giant heatsink and turn this into the EVAC model. I mean, look at this thing, it's huge. With that, I think we have a lot to get to, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we're gonna talk about this server, the ASRock rack, to you 1G B650, but we're also gonna talk about the EVAC version of it, and perhaps most importantly, you do not have to use an AMD Ryzen in this server anymore like when we first reviewed it. Instead, you can use the brand new AMD Epic 4000 series. I have been campaigning for a Ryzen-based Epic processor for years. And the reason I'm so jazzed about this is that the Epic 4000 series brings the performance and core counts of the AMD Ryzen series to the entry server market. And not only are the processors less expensive, but the server platforms are much less expensive than the larger server platforms that we see in the mainstream server market. With that, I think it's time to get to the hardware. Okay, so let's talk about the Epic 4000 series. And let's get the first part of this like out of the way. I just think it's worthwhile. Uh, these are essentially Ryzen processors. And you're gonna see that they scale from about four cores up to 16 cores. There are also X versions with 3D vCache. But just to give you some idea of how similar these are, this is the 16 core AMD Epic 4564P. In my other hand, I have an AMD Ryzen 9 7950X. You can see that these things are very, very similar. And that's really the idea. You're using the same socket. You're also using Zen 4 cores. You get the RDNA 2 like iGPU that's in this thing, just like you would on one of the newer Ryzen's. And price-wise, very similar to the Intel Xeon E series, you're paying pretty much a similar price for the Epic processors as you are for the consumer Ryzen processors, right? There's not like a huge, there's not like 2X the price or anything like that. Now, this processor is a 690 nine dollar part but it's also 170 watts there is a lower tdp 120 watt processor that has 3d vcache just like you would have on the amd ryzen side that one's also 699 dollars and at the low end there is a four core skew we also have this which is a six core skew and from a price range you're talking about 149 list up to about 699 dollars list that is much less expensive than a lot of the higher end cpus that we see these days and what you get with these processors is frankly amazing for the segment. Back in the day, your option for a Intel processor, at least a supported server processor in this segment was you had to get an Intel Xeon E series. Now that was the E3 version one through six series. Now we had the Xeon E21, 22, 23, 2400 series. There have been a ton here. But the interesting thing here is that Intel only uses its P cores for this market. So you don't get the P plus E cores. And because you're not getting those mixed cores, there are things like, you know, if you're using VMware or something like that, your Xeon E processors will actually run out of the box. But the flip side to it is you only get up to eight P cores. So the idea of having 16 Zen 4 cores is something that people in the segment should absolutely salivate over even if it's at a $90 premium. Frankly, going from eight cores to 16 cores for $90 from, I think it was like 609 or just over $600 for the eight core Intel part versus uh, 699 for this. I mean, I, I would take this any day, right? A lot of folks are just gonna say, hey, why would I not just use a Ryzen processor? They use the same sockets. You know, we just flash the BIOS on the server, install a new heatsink, and we're ready to go with a new processor. Like, what, what's the whole point of having an Epic versus a Ryzen? I mean, I have to say, I do think that's fair. But on the other hand, let me just kind of give you a little bit of context on why these are so important. So with the Epic series, and even with the Intel Xeon series, it's the same thing on either side, you have to have support for server platforms. And server platforms are usually not running things like Windows 11. Usually they're running things like Linux. They might be running VMware, Windows Server, all of those types of applications. And you also have things like hypervisors that are extremely prevalent. For things like ECC support, for years, people have known that Ryzen doesn't shut ECC support off, but it kind of really depends on the platform and all that other kind of stuff if you're gonna support ECC memory. But if you have an Epic, 
you have to support ECC memory. You have to support those server OSs and those server platforms, server NICs, all of that kind of stuff has to happen. And that's typically why we see the Xeon, but also now the Epic launches trail their desktop counterparts by some time. There's extra qualification steps that are needed. And frankly, if I were building a new server and I had to choose between a Ryzen and an Epic for a server platform, I would 100% go with the Epic. And we don't have one yet, but the AMD Epic 4464P, which is 12 cores, 65 watts, and I think like $429, that would be the number one processor that I would go after just because uh, that is super low power and it'll give you a lot of performance. And that's a lot about the Epic processors, but let's get to the server that we're gonna install this in. Now to test out the AMD Epic 4004 series, what we're using is this server, which is the ASRock Rack 2U 1G B650. Now we actually did a review of this exact server not too long ago but there are different cooling options that are available. So while we did the original review using just the kind of standard heatsink, which looks a little bit something like this over here, now we have a new version with the EVAP cooler. Now the EVAP cooler is of course much larger, but at the same time, why don't we take a few seconds just to take a look around this ASRock rack server because I wanna show you what a Ryzen or an Epic 4004 server looks like today. The reason that this server is so different is that if you look at the front of it, you don't see any hard drives or any SSD spaces. Instead, there's maybe like power buttons, LEDs, or some USB ports, but that's about it. Now, taking a look at the rear of the system also doesn't have any hot swap drive base. So this is a very specific server for a very specific reason. And I'm gonna show you that in a second, but let's just kind of take a look while we're back here at some of the features you get. Like first, you get your redundant power supplies. Now these are actually 1.2 kilowatt units because this server is designed for GPUs and not just little GPUs, big GPUs too. Now, aside from your power supplies, you get things like your basic VGA and serial and all that kind of stuff for your out of band management. You also get USB and you get an out of band management port. We went over the management interface on the main site when we did the review. So if you wanna go check that out, you can, but it's a pretty industry standard version. Now, the other feature you get is dual one gig ethernet and these are Intel i210s. Now, of course, the idea is that if you do want something like 10 gig ethernet or something faster, you would use the expansion slot for that. Now, let's talk about the expansion slots for a second here, right? Because the first expansion slot is perhaps the most interesting here. Um, you take the riser, you just kind of pop it out and it just pops out really easily. Uh, you're gonna see that we have a three slot riser, but it's a PCIe Gen 5 by 16 riser. And so with that, you can do something like you take this uh, NVIDIA RTX 6000 ADA edition and you just pop it in here, no problem. Now, of course, we'll talk about the power when we get inside of this, but we also tested the A6000. We also tested a couple of AMD GPUs. And so there are a lot of different GPU options and having the three slot version over here gives you enough room that if you have a larger than a, uh, you know, kind of standard dual slot GPU, you can fit that in here. Now, the other riser that you have is this one, which is a PCIe Gen 4 by four riser, but it has a by 16 slot. So even though it's by 16, it's actually only a by four riser. Now that is where you would normally put a high speed NIC. Now, of course, today's modern servers use fairly fast NICs. And I'm gonna show you one uh, that literally is gonna be released the same day as this video, hopefully, uh, which is this one right here, which is a Broadcom 400 gigabit ethernet adapter. Now, of course, while that's more for PCIe Gen 5, if you only have a PCIe Gen 4 by four, you're probably talking about 50 gigabits per second of total like uh, bandwidth. So if you do have a NIC that can run on a PCIe Gen 4 by four that can run dual 25 gig, you're probably okay. But you also are gonna have no problem with a single port of 25 gig or something like dual 10 gig or something like that. Now, of course, it'd be super easy to go run a 25 gig single port NIC or a dual 10 gig NIC on this, and that's pretty much what you're gonna get for your high speed networking. But I think the idea here is really that this is cost optimized because you don't have it on the motherboard, you can customize it. So if you want SFP or 10G base T or something like that, you can pick whichever one you want. Now we mentioned that this is the EVAC unit. And just to kind of give you some idea, this is the uh, non-EVAC unit heatsink, which is a decent little one you heatsink. Uh, but when you look at this thing, I mean, it is clearly much, much larger. And the reason for that is that by providing more cooling for GPUs, you get more headroom for something like a faster CPU. And that's why we have multiple different airflow guides for this server as well. 
So your Ryzen or AMD Epic 4004 goes right here. You have your heatsink here, but the motherboard also has a couple of other features. For example, there are two M.2 slots, and that's really where you're gonna have your storage. You're not gonna have a whole bunch of hot swap base, so you're basically gonna use your internal storage for that. We also get a heatsink for our B650 chipset, and there is a little BIOS postcode feature, so if you need that to troubleshoot, you have it. Now, another fun thing, though, is this power supply cable situation up here. And so the idea is that you get an adapter kind of like this one, which takes your GPU power from the redundant power supplies and puts it into something that is useful for your GPU. But of course, I guess the real question is, how does this thing perform? So let's go look at that next. Okay, now talking about just the performance, just in general here, you're getting somewhere between 60 to 80% more performance going from the top of the line 600 and change dollar Intel Xeon E2488 to the AMD Epic 4564P. Now, of course you are doubling the core count, but you're also getting a lot more performance and that's the max performance part you can get in an Intel socket. So after you go past that, you end up having to go to a bigger socket. Now, I wish that we had some of the mid-range SKUs, the 12 core, eight core parts, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, guys, let's just face it here. Uh, th this is a straight shellacking, right? AMD just has a lot more performance per socket. And we also know that Zen 4 is super competitive versus an Intel P core. So I, I, I just kind of think that this is one of those ones where it is very clear to me that AMD has an awesome line here. But the next question is about power consumption. So let's get over to the other set so we can see that. Okay, let's talk about the power consumption and noise really quickly. Now this has some giant fans that you can probably hear right now because we're over 50 dBA. That's at idle by the way, and our power consumption at the wall is ranging between about 75 and 80 watts. And just really quick at the package power consumption level, we're somewhere in that like 23 to 25 watt range. Now, if we go and stress this CPU to 100%, we are gonna see the fan spin up and we will see the noise go well over 70 dBA and we're gonna see the power consumption at the wall go well over 400 watts. This is actually not that far off from a, you know, modern server, like kind of big socket server CPU. I was actually kind of surprised with how much power this used. And at CPU socket level, we're seeing over 180 watts. Now, more than likely, that has something to do with the fan profiles here, because we just don't have the GPUs installed or anything that would really make this a higher power box. Now, of course, the server itself can support a GPU, but on the other hand, um, you know, this is also not a low power CPU with that like 170, 180 watt at the, you know, just package. It kind of feels like it's a probably a higher end CPU than you would expect to see in a lot of cases. So that's why I really like the idea of like a 12 core 65 watt TDP CPU. I actually think that that's what I would deploy more often. Hey guys, just a quick update. The power numbers that we saw here seemed really high and we found out what was going on. The fans were actually just blasting ready for cooling a GPU. So we got a lot higher power numbers on the overall system power than we should have seen normally. Now, of course the package power consumption was correct but the fans were really there for like a super high performance GPU mode and not for a just kind of normal operation. So I just want to be very clear that that's one of the purposes of the servers that it can run these hot GPUs, but at the same time, it is going to use more power just to go push air through, especially with passively cool GPUs. Now we do have a six core processor as well. And using that, we were able to get power consumption on a server under 125 watts. So it is something that I think with a little bit of tuning, you can get these, especially if you have like a 65 watt TDP part, you can of course get a system to be under 120 watts, which means that you can put this in a one amp, 120 volt power budget per U. With that, let's keep going. Okay, now with all of these videos, I like to have a key lessons learned section. I mean, what did we learn from going through and doing all of this work, reviewing a server, seeing new processors, all of that? I mentioned earlier that I think that this is one of those areas that AMD has needed to do for years. They frankly didn't, and it makes a lot of sense why not. When AMD was transitioning to the Rome era in 2019, they were getting like 50,000 CPU orders from hyperscalers before the launch, so they knew they had a hit on their hands. Frankly, selling a CPU into the hyperscale market where you know that there's only a few configurations that they're gonna have to run, that's a much easier model than selling like a $149 CPU or $700 CPU or whatever to a bunch of enthusiasts, to small system builders, hosting providers. And so I get why it's taken AMD this long. 
But on the other hand, the importance of this ASRock platform should be very clear to folks. But if not, let me make it even more clear. The reason that this is an awesome little processor is because it is tiny. This is much smaller than all of the other processors that AMD has in its server lineup. Just for some scale sense, right? This is an AMD Epic Bergamo, so Genoa is the same size. This goes up to 128 cores. It has a ton of PCIe Gen 5 lanes, 12 memory channels, all of that kind of stuff. And so you need all of the pins on the back of this to be able to support all of that I.O. All that I.O. then has to go to a motherboard, which tends to cost a ton of money these days because there is so much I.O. on a giant chip like this. And so last year, AMD decided to go down market finally, and they made a smaller platform, which is the AMD Epic 8004 series Sienna, but the SP6 socket has less I.O., for example, only having six memory channels versus having 12. And so therefore this has less expensive motherboards because you're not having to route all of that I.O. from the chip onto the motherboard. And that really brings us to this ASRock Rack server, right? Because we now have a tiny little CPU with relatively little I.O. I mean, this is only two memory channels. There's relatively less PCIe Gen 5 and all that kind of stuff on here. And so that makes for a cheaper motherboard. A less expensive processor plus a less expensive motherboard means that you get a less expensive server. I mean, especially if you get the 65 watt TDP parts, I mean, they're gonna use a so much less power than the bigger chips. That's also a huge operational savings. Now, the other side to these processors is the fact that they run at ridiculously high clock speeds. That means that if you have something like a Windows Server license where you're getting 16 core license packs, then getting a high speed 16 core processor like this that can actually run at over five gigahertz at times that means that you're getting more effective use of those license or those per core license features. There's other software, of course, that's also licensed on a per core basis. And so something like this Epic processor is a really good example of how you can maximize your investment in that software. If you have something like Xeon E, then you probably have to go move to that higher end platform, that higher end platform with higher end power consumption, with higher cost components and all that kind of stuff. It's just something that you have to do. And so if you really wanna optimize, maybe using something like this is a good idea. I I am gonna say though, I do wish that AMD, instead of having UDIM support like on the Ryzen series, changed the memory support to RDIM support because frankly, if you could have RDIM support on these and have high memory capacity, that would be like a complete game changer. And I don't even know what Intel would do at that point. But of course with DDR5, ECC UDIMs and RDIMs are physically different. So you can't interchange them like you could in the DDR4 and previous generations. We have a whole video on that. We'll link in the description. But overall, I can see a ton of use cases where people are gonna wanna take these processors, a GPU, a short depth chassis, and say, hey, let's go make a cool server out of it. And that's exactly what this ASRock Rack platform is. Now, this is far from the fanciest server that we've reviewed, but I think a lot of folks are really gonna latch onto this model. And the fact that we can now use an Epic processor instead of a Ryzen processor, there's a new option in the market, I think is really gonna spur this generation of processors or next generations of processors because Intel is gonna have to find a way to, I don't know how, but they're going to have to find a way to respond. For now though, in the low power segment, these AMD Epic 4004 series processors and servers like this ASRock Rack server, they are definitely at the top of the game right now. And hey, if you like the Epic 4004 series, you like this video, why don't you share it with your friends and colleagues? But also why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.